Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to present our data we generated over the last years here. Um, I think those data are very important, and I would like to take the chance to thank Ruben for a very nice title. So that was very creative. Ruben, I think that's from you. Um, most of you are aware that the most limiting adverse effect of IMIDS, uh, that means lenalidomide and pomalidomide, is neutropenia. In refractory re relapsed multiple myeloma patients, up to 40% of the patients develop a grade 3 or 4 neutropenia. Up to 15% develop thrombocytopenia, grade 3 or 4, and it really inhibits our ability to use those, use those drugs. Uh, we also have reports from Dr. Mazumda, who reported that uh, up to 43% of the patients fail to mobilize hematopoietic progenitors after long-term treatment with lenalidomide. So we had two questions. First of all, what is the effect of IMIDS on hematopoietic stem cells? Is this effect toxic? And second, why do IMIDS inhibit the mobilization of CD34 cells? So for this purpose, our laboratory spent the last, I would say, 10 years on the evaluation of the effects of IMIDS, lenalidomide and pomalidomide, on hematopoietic progenitors. And after we delineated the effect of those drugs on osteoclasts, also erythrocytes and plasma cells, we were also interested, and I would like to present the data here, the effect on neutrophils and also on megakaryocytes. So for this purpose, we started our work by using CD34 cells and simply performing colony formation assays. And what we observed was pretty striking, as you can see here, and in contrast to what we would expect in patients who are neutropenic, we saw an upregulation of the CFUG of the granulocytic progenitors colonies. We observed that this lenalidomide and pomalidomide, and you can see that this was the expense of the red colonies of the BFUEs. To analyze those cells a little bit better in detail, we performed flow cytometry analysis of the CD34 cells here from liquid cultures treated with IMIDS for 14 days. Um, and you can see that there's a slight increase in the CD34 cells as treated with pomalidomide. But what is more strikingly is that with pomalidomide, you see a strong induction of the myelite markers, the CD33 cells, in comparison to our control group. What you also can see in the cell cycle analysis is there was a strong induction of the S phase of the cells from 20 to almost 50% of the proliferating cells. So, but what does it mean for our patients? So we went back and analyzed our bone marrow samples of patients, and Ellen List was very helpful providing samples from patients who received treatment with lenalidomide and actually received or had a um, really a low ANC below 500. And he did bone marrow biopsy pre-treatment, and that's the time of the white blood count mania, as you can see here. So again, in accordance um, with, our, uh, prim with our prior data from colony formation assay, you can see here that the myelite erythrocyte ratio shifted from mean 2 to 9. That means there was really um, in development of the myelite progenitors. The cellularity was pretty much unchanged and not what you expect with toxic effects of chemotherapy. So also, I would like to draw your attention to the morphology of the cells. As you can see here, at the time of the white blood count nadir, you see much more immature cells um, pointed out by the red arrow here. So having those studies and those information, we went back to our literature and did multiple, multiple studies. Um, and we found and it is known that PU1 granulocytes, PU1 knockout granulocytes, sorry, do not undergo complete maturation. And we also know that the heterozygous deletion of PU1 is associated with development of AML. So we hypothesized that an independent downregulation of PU1 induces a maturational arrest of the granulocytes, resulting in peripheral blood neutropenia. And in order to start to prove our hypothesis, we again went back to our liquid cultures. We used CD34 cells and cultured them with stem cell factor IL-3, IL-6, and with our image pomalidomide in the upper panel and lenalidomide in the lower panel. And you can see that after six and eight days, lenalidomide and pomalidomide completely downregulated the expression of PU1 protein. But again, what does it mean for our patients? So we went back to our patient samples, and we were able to have samples, a variety of samples from patients pre-treatment bone marrow samples and during cycle four of ref dex treatment and compared those samples with patients who only received dexamethasone. 
we performed a double labeling of the cells in order to identify the myeloid cells. Those were positive for myeloid peroxidase, and we stained PU1 here in black. You can see that there is a strong downregulation of the PU1 during the treatment with lenalidomide in the, in the patients treated uh, with lenalidomide. So in summary, we think that PU1 is a critical factor involved in the maturation of the neutrophils. And the downregulation of PU1 by imids inhibits, inhibits the maturation with an accumulation of immature granulocytes. So the immature granulocytes cannot exit the bone marrow, which subsequently leads to the de development of neutropenia. But again, I told you that uh, we are also interested in the effect on the megakaryocyte lineages. And I would like to share the next uh, few minutes with you our results on the megakaryocytes. Again, in order to evaluate the effect of imids on the megakaryocytic lineage, we went back and used megacold C assays. Those are special colony forming assays promoting the development of megakaryocytic colonies. And we cultured those cells in the presence with pomalidomide or with DMSO. And you can see there was a strong induction in the megakaryocytic colonies. Again, that was a surprise for us because patients treated with lenalidomide, pomalidomide have, mega, have thrombocytopenia. So further, we were interested also in the analysis of those cells. Are they proliferative? And cell cycle analysis revealed, similar to our results with the myelite cells, that there was, first of all, an increase in the S phase. But was, what was also very striking, that there was a dramatic decrease in the apoptotic cells, almost from 60 to 6 percent after seven days. And here you can see the same 70 to 8 percent uh, after 14 days. So the increase in the S phase and decrease in the apoptosis was further reflected by an exponential growth of the cells. You can see that lenalidomide expanded the cells as in within 14 days. But if you look for pomalidomide, you see a constant growth beyond the 14 days. And we were able sometimes to keep those cells alive in liquid cultures up to four months, which is really quite amazing. Usually, hematopoietic stem cells undergo differentiation, and you cannot keep those cells longer in liquid culture than three, maximum of four weeks. The further analysis of those cells, of CD34 cells, again treated for 14 days with pomalidomide in the presence of megakaryocytic inducible conditions showed that indeed we have an increased population of CD34 cells with pomalidomide and with TPO. But interestingly, the further, further analysis of those cells showed that the CD34 positive cell population also expresses megakaryocytic markers, as you can see here, and as in use and expected, but also still expresses CD33. So that means that we have a development of early immature cells expressing CD, CD41 and CD33. I mentioned already that we were able to maintain our cultures up to four months, and the analysis of those cells, for sure we had no control after four months, only cells treated with pomalidomide, uh, showed again that we were able to keep a small population of CD34 positive cells up to four months in our cultures. And analysis of those cells showed again that there are myelite expression, CD33, but also megakaryocytic ex expression markers on those cells, showing us that we maintain a small cell clone of CD34 cells also expressing megakaryocytic and myelite markers. But I mentioned already that we were especially interested what happens further with the megakaryocyte and what are the effects on the development. And we analyzed by flow cytometry whether we have an increased population of immature megakaryocytes. And immature megakaryocytes are characterized by 41A, 40, 42B negativity. And you can see, especially on day 10, we see an increase in the immature cells if treated with lenalidomide and pomalidomide. So this was also reflected by the morphology in the Giemsa staining, CD61 and electron microscopy. You can clearly see that cells cultured with lenalidomide and with pomalidomide had a more immature appearance with a small cytoplasm or less cytoplasm and also hypolobulation. Um, in order to quantify whether we really have a hypoploidy in those immature cells developed under um, lenalidomide or pomalidomide, we performed fish studies. 
And first of all, we identified our megakaryocyte by staining them CD, with CD61 FITSI labeled antibody, and those cells appear in green here. Uh, we labeled our nuclei by TAVI staining in blue and also used the centromeric enumeration probe 6 in order to visualize the nuclei. And I think it's very striking that you see the difference in morphology. You see the very immature megakaryocytes under the treatment with pomalidomide. And also our quantification reflected that there was a lot of immaturity, so the nuclei numbers decreased in the presence of pomalidomide, the ploidy number in decreased, and we saw an increase in the hypoploid cells, the diploid cells. You can see the cells, the two end cells go up, whereas the hyperdiploid cells are reduced in the presence of pomalidomide. <clears throat> so what is the mechanism? We know that GATA1 is critical for the development of megakaryocytes, but also erythrocytes. So we hypothesized that GATA1 is one of the critical factors in this process inhibiting the maturation of megakaryocytes. And indeed, as you can see here, by PCR, there's a downregulation of GATA1 induced by lenalidomide and pomalidomide, which we also saw in the Western blot and here by immunofluorescence. You can see lenalidomide and pomalidomide decreases GATA1 in the nucleus substantially. So in order to prove our hypothesis, we thought we have to overexpress GATA1 in those cells and see whether they become, whether we can reverse the effect and induce a maturation. And for this purpose, we transfected by lentivirus our CD34 cells either with an empty vector or with GATA1. And you can see that we could see expression of GATA1 despite treatment with lenalidomide and pomalidomide. This is a functional assay whether our cells are still able to function and form colonies. Interestingly, you can see that the downregulation of the red colonies induced by len and pom could be rescued and rever uh, reversed, speaking for the functionality of GATA1. But I think what is very striking is that in the empty vector transfected cells, you still see the immature megakaryocytes. They are much smaller and hypolobulated. But if you look for the GATA1 overexpressing cells, there is a rescue effect of GATA1. And you can see that those cells undergo much more maturation despite they are treated with pomalidomide. So taken together, we hypothesize that imids affect GATA1 and subsequently multiple transfection factors and also cyclins, which I cannot go in detail due to our time restrictions. But we know that those factors are critically involved in the terminal differentiation and also polyploidization of our cells. And once this process is interrupted, the, the, the megakaryocytes cannot fully mature. But I also want to draw your attention on the fact that we found initially that there was an increased expansion or renewal or maintenance of CD34 cells, and also a proliferation of early hematoprogenitors. And I think it's important to understand that most of our stem cells are quiescent. 95% of our stem cells in the bone marrow are non-proliferating. This is in order to really make sure that we have a lifelong presence or uh, availability of stem cells. But once we push our hematopoietic progenitor in constant cell cycle, it might lead to an early exhaustion of the stem cell pool. So in conclusion, imits and use an expansion of the hematopoietic progenitors with concomitant inhibition of maturation. And I mentioned that they especially push into the myelite development. So the inhibition of the maturation we think it's by the downregulation of critical transcription factors such as PU1 and also GATA1. So the significance of our results is not quite clear, not completely clear, and you have to keep in mind that we did all those experiments in vitro. But it is known that mutations in the PU1 and in the GATA1 gene have been described in multiple hematologic malignancies. Um, based on our findings, I think it's also important that we give our patients, for instance, for long-term treatment with lenalidomide treatment breaks in order to allow a maturation of, for instance, hematopoietic progenitors. I don't know how long that break should be. It's just an, I would say, hypothetical approach. But I still owe you to answer the second question, and I promise I will kind of, you know, make it quite short. Um, very simple question. Why do we have mobilization failure in patients who got a long-term treatment um, with imits? We know that, and Dr. Mazumba, I mentioned that already published that 43% that of the patients fail to mobilize hematopoietic progenitors after prolonged lenalidomide treatment. And we know that we can often or almost uh, 
always um, overcome those mobilization failure by using Plerixafor, which is a CXCR4 antagonist. So this question was very simple, and we asked, <clears throat> what is the role of the SDF1-alpha, which is a ligand for the CXCR4 receptor, in lenalidomide-induced mobilization failure? And we started first to treat, again, our CD34 cells in culture with lenalidomide and pomalidomide for several days um, to analyze for the expression of the CXCR4 receptor. And what you can see, indeed, there is an increase of the CXCR4 receptor on the surface of those cells. Next, we wanted to know whether there's really an increase in the quantity of the receptor, but you can see there's not an increase in the production. PCR and also Western blood showed the same amount of the receptor in cells despite the treatment with lenalidomide and pomalidomide. But once we really select the membrane part and the cytosol of the cells, we see that lenalidomide treatment induced the localization of CXTR4 to the membrane, means that lenalidomide really localizes the receptor to the cell surface. This was confirmed by immunofluorescence. You can see in our control, you have a nicely distribution of the CXCR4 receptor in the cytosol. But once you treat the cells with lenalidomide, you have a predominant localization at the cell surface. <clears throat> this was also reflected by functional assays. We could see that in migration assays using transfer, lenalidomide treatment and also pomalidomide treatment could increase the migration of CD34 cells towards SDF1 alpha, which was used as a migration activator. And last but not least, what we did next, we treated those cells with SDF1 alpha. SDF1 alpha in high dosages would usually induce an internalization as a receptor of the receptor into the cell. And indeed, you can see nicely that the CXCR4 receptor internalizes in the cells under the treatment with SDF1 alpha. You see that by the white dots. In contrast, lenalidomide treatment, at least in part, inhibited or prohibited this um, internalization of the receptor. So we think that, in conclusion, lenalidomide induces a localization of the CXCR4 receptor to the cell membrane and inhibits, at the same time, the internalization of CXCR4, resulting in increased migration. But it, what is even more important is that the inhibition of the internalization of the CXCR4 receptor results in increased binding of the CD34 cells to the bone marrow niche. So the SDF1-alpha is a strong signal for the CD34 cells to stay in the bone marrow. And we think that blocking CXCR4 receptor with Plerixafor releases the CD34 cells from the increased binding in the bone marrow niche. And I would like to close with the acknowledgement of my former collaborators and postdoc in Pittsburgh and my current collaborators at the Columbia University, and especially Sarah Monaghan, who helped tremendously with the pathology of all those patients. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.